All right, welcome to the second part of our lecture on site and situation factors and why they matter when we're talking about industrial location. The slides themselves were designed to accompany the book for cultural landscape, and I am, of course, your narrator for the day, Ms. Gall. So um, let me go ahead, and I didn't put a slide in on this one, I probably should have, to remind you a little bit about what situation factors are. And situation factors, what they are is how connected one area is to another area. Okay, so that's when we're looking at, for instance, modes of transportation. Um, we're looking at how easy it is to get into or out of an area. Um, and when we're talking about industrial location, really what we're talking about is how easy is it to get the resources that we need. And in particular now, we're talking about natural resources for the most part. Okay, so, um, for instance, when we're talking about... Um, talking about industrial location in the mid to late 1800s, industry by and large, we're talking about what these days we would call heavy industry, steel manufacturing, coal mining, things like that. Okay, so what our goal was, was to locate close to the inputs, okay, close to those raw resources. And so when you look at our um, map here, for instance, you can see we've got they call them integrated steel mills, which meant that they um, process both the iron and the coal. And it shows um, where the iron ore deposits are, where the coal deposits are, okay. and then also where the steel industries were located. And as you can see, by and large, what we're really looking at are places that are reasonably close to their inputs. And the reason for that, and these are what we call bulk reducing industries, meaning that as we're producing the product, the final product actually weighs less than and takes up less space than its original inputs. And natural resources are great examples of bulk reducing industries. So for instance, if we talk about copper, when you pull copper out of the ground, it's got all kinds of impurities in it. So you take it in and you um, you do what's called smelting it, is what they call the process. And basically what you're doing when you're smelting is you're burning off all of those impurities. And when you do that, you reduce the weight and reduce the volume of the copper. Okay. Steel works more or less the same way. You take iron and you infuse it with carbon, okay, from by and large from coal deposits, and you do this at very, very high temperatures. And then what you've got is a liquid metal that you can pour into um, molds to get out the, the steel that you need in the shapes that you need it. Okay, so um, we're looking at, and we're talking about the East Coast of the United States, which is one of the earlier areas. Um, well, in the U.S., this is where those major um, steel producing and um, where those major steel producing industries are, right? And as John Green likes to say in his lecture about the Industrial Revolution, you know, Pennsylvania still has, or Philadelphia still has 11 steelers, right? Steelers meaning people who work in the steel mill. You can see why they located roughly where they did, right? They're locating on areas where there's major waterways, okay? Um, I know you can't tell, but in Maryland by the coast, there's actually a major waterway there, right? It's, there's a, um, canal that cuts through and some rivers and things. So what you see is they're often they're located right near where they can get major transportation. They choose to locate generally near either a coal deposit or an iron deposit, generally coal because it's heavier, and then also close to transportation nodes, right? So this is a huge thing we're talking about um, the situation factors. And the other way to look at it is to talk about what are called bulk gaining industries. Okay? And bulk gaining industries are where the final product actually weighs more and um, has larger dimensions than the original product. So for instance, if we're looking at, and on our map here, we're looking at kind of the Midwest of the United States, right around the Great Lakes, we're talking about auto parts plants. Okay? Um, and then, so our auto parts plants are red and green, U.S. and foreign owned respectively, and then the yellow dots are the assembly plants. And assembly plants are where they take those individual parts, they put them together, and they produce the cars that you and I know and love. 
right? So the assembly plants are bulk gaining industries. And these bulk gaining industries, at the end of the day, they want to be close to major um, thoroughfares, for lack of a better term, where they can um, move things in and move things out easily and cheaply because, and they want to be as close to their markets as possible because transportation costs matter. Right, so um, great examples of, of bulk gaining industries, fabricated metals, cars are a great example of that. Okay, fabricated just means that they've, they've got them cut out and they're using them in real specific ways. Beverage production is always my favorite example, right? You go to the store, you buy a Pepsi, you buy a Coke. Um, what you'll notice is if you read the labels and you can go through and do this, you'll notice that there's an address for the bottling plant. Okay. Coke and Pepsi don't bottle at their headquarters in the southeast. Okay, they just don't do it. What they do from there is they ship out the syrup, and if you've worked in restaurants at all, you know what syrup is, right? It's this big, heavy, gloppy, nasty stuff. But when you add water to it, when you add carbon dioxide to it, it turns into soda pop. Well, when you add those two things, you also add bulk. Right, you add weight and you add volume. And so as a result, they add those bulks as close as possible to the or to the consumers. Because it's expensive to ship this stuff, right? Okay. Um the other thing to look at when talking about proximity to markets is what are called single market manufacturers. Okay, so if they're um only gonna sell to a single market then they're going to locate close to that market, obviously. And also anything that's perishable. So if it's a food product that's going to go bad, they tend to locate closer to their market. And if they don't, they tend to be significantly more willing to pay a lot for transportation. Right? So, for instance, here in the Pacific Northwest, if you watch the news, every year what you'll see on the news is they'll talk about the first of the Copper River salmon coming down. Well, what do they do with Copper River salmon? It's a perishable product. Right? Copper River's up in Alaska, it's not close to here, they ship it on an airplane. Very, very expensive, but also very, very quick. I can tell you from experience, the flight from Anchorage to Seattle takes roughly three and a half hours. Copper River's a little further north of there, tack on roughly two days by the time you have to deal with uh, transportation issues in Alaska with the whole separate ball of wax. And you're getting your salmon within two to three days, which is really pretty impressive when you stop and think about the fact that Alaska is roughly 3,000 miles away. Okay, so situation matters, and specifically that ability to be close to transportation hubs matter. Okay, um, so when we're talking about situation factors, again, okay, we're talking a lot about connections. Okay, so we talk about how are we going to ship our products? Are we going to put it on a boat? Are we going to put it on a train? Are we going to put it on a truck? Are we going to send it through the air? In general, further something is transported, the lower the cost is per kilometer per mile. But the cost decreases vary, and they go down at different rates for each of the four modes. So trucks, for instance, comparatively cheap if we're going short distance travel. Okay. Um, trains typically longer distances, one day plus, because we can involve fewer fewer trains, fewer resources, and things like that. Okay, And also with trucks and trains, you're limited, because you're limited. Trucks can only go where there are roads, and in particular where the roads are in good enough condition to support them. Trains go only where the tracks are. Right? Talk about ships and airplanes. Ships are slow, but very, very, very cheap. Matter of fact, these days, cost of shipping by ship is so um, cheap as to be basically negligible when we're talking about factory location. Okay. Ships can only go, though, container ships can only go where there's water deep enough to support them. And then we've got air, which is the most expensive, but it's also the quickest. And that's why when we're talking about perishable products, air increases how far away a... a the input can be from the final from the market because it can get it there very very quickly. 
So that's our quick lecture to talk about situation factors. Again, paired up with the site factors lecture. And situation factors, what we're really looking at is interconnectedness. So we talked about some of the different modes of transportation and how um, costs can vary and what difference that makes. And we looked at bulk gaining industries and bulk reducing industries and talked about some of the vagaries of location when we're talking about situation factors for those, right? For bulk gaining industries, you want to locate close to your market because you're adding weight, which means you're adding cost, transportation costs. For bulk reducing industries, you locate close to your you locate close to your inputs because you're going to be losing weight, which is going to make your transportation costs even cheaper. If you have any questions, by all means, please feel free to come and see me, and we'll talk about these a little bit more in class when we talk about Weber's least cost theory. Um, and I'd be delighted to answer any questions you have.